Hi, Nick here from Pods with Nick and James. Just a quick one before we get into this podcast. I'm going to say a massive thank you for the uh, support that we've received since starting these podcasts. We thoroughly enjoy it and we look forward to creating more. If you want to have your say on any topics that we've discussed or suggest future topics, then you can do so at www.reddit.com slash r slash Nick and James Pods. And if you want to support us, you can do so for uh, from as little as £1 a month. And you can do that at www.patreon.com slash James. Anyway, back to the podcast. Hi, welcome to Pods with Nick and James. Um, today's uh, subject is going to be um, a brief overview of Western medicine um, with an episode to follow with some of the fa- modern failings of uh, the medical uh, industrial system, uh, which will be hosted by Nick next time. Um, uh, just as just before we even get going, um, I've got a bit of a cold here, so if I cough horribly, uh, sorry listeners, I do not mean to give you that experience, it's just going to be impossible. Um, and I also want to um, just give a shout out to my sources, uh, the main sources being the videos of Patrick Kelly, a YouTuber who does a lot of stuff on the history of medicine. Um, the author of the book... Uh, the History of Medicine, a very short introduction uh, by William uh, Bryanison, and then um, a, a massive uh, shout out to uh, my cousin Emily, who um, just through a, a conversation with her uh, taught me a lot of points uh, that hadn't been covered uh, in the book, uh, The History of Medicine. Uh, and for just kind of having a conversation with someone makes it so much easier to remember these facts. So, Emily, thank you very much. Um, okay, so I'll, I guess we'll uh, we'll jump in. Um, medicine, as so, medicine is unlike um, science in that it although it is scientific and we are going to be focusing on the scientific practice of medicine unlike science it wasn't just a term that was coined in 1836 um there have been doctors there have been healers since the birth of mankind just as there have i imagine in all civilizations always been some form of sickness and infirmity. Um, I realise, uh, Nick, you're quite a well-versed man, so uh, you may already uh, you may already know this. But who do history and hist- uh, Do you know who historians um, see as the father of Western medicine? I feel like I should know it, but I don't. I'm afraid. That's absolutely fine. I feel I should be able to quote when the Magna Carta uh, was done. I can't. I couldn't tell you. I should be able to tell you when the the Gutenberg printing press uh, was made. Off the top of my head, I I couldn't tell you. Um, but I can tell you uh, because I've researched it recently that the father of modern medicine uh, was somebody called uh, Hippocrates. Oh, I um, did know that. With, yeah, <laughs> Hippocrates of Kos. That's why now, it's the enough, Hippocratic he... Oath. <clears throat> exactly, exactly, exactly. So, okay, so with the Hippocratic Oath also, um, interesting fact, Hippocratic Oath has nothing to do with Hippo- with it's got it's to do with Hippocrates, the person, or Hippocrates's corpus, 
which means his body of writings, hence the word corpse. Um, well, not it's not the cause of the word corpse, I'm just explaining it. Uh, yeah. Going too far already. <laughs> Tangent. All right. Um, but just as an interesting fact, uh, yeah, Hippocratic is, the, is different from hypocritic or hypocritical. Hypocritical comes from the word hypocritis, which means actor in Greek. Um, I've probably murdered the pronunciation there, but um, so it's just unfortunate that this person had a name which sounds really, really similar to actor in Greek, rather than him actually being a hypocrite or not practicing what he preaches. Yeah, because the last um, thing you want to know that your doctor took before he became a doctor was a an oath of hypocrisy, um, I suppose. Exactly, exactly. It's almost like the traitor's oath from, uh, yeah, from this uh, uh, terrible BBC series, which is like totally, totally just indoctrinated me, and it just kind of grabs me every time. <laughs> right. It's it's all I can say is it's fantastic garbage, absolutely love it. Cannot, yeah. But anyway, moving on, moving swiftly on. Um, okay, so Hippocrates uh, lived um, in about 460 BC. Uh, so again, a couple of hundred years uh, after the invention of coins um, in Lydia, uh, the island of Kos is off of is just off the coast off of modern day Turkey. Uh, or is part of modern day Turkey, from what I've been told. Um, he, he, yeah, at the time, uh, the ideas of Epi, oh, Epiduke, Epidoclus, damn it, I've mispronounced that. Epidem, Epidemius, Epid, damn it. The person who invented the f idea of the four elements, or at least the Greek Western version of the four elements. Please note, in Indian uh, elementalism, there's five elements where it is just the four normal ones of fire, uh, fire, earth, water, and air. But they also, the Indians bother to include ether. Yeah, um, the spirit. Which I'll need to... Yeah, the spirit, the void, the, the unknown, which I actually think... Uh, I just like the fact that it's included. I think, uh, I think that... But anyway, um, please note also the Chinese had their own elementalism of fire, water, air, and then they split earth into wood and metal, um, which is an interesting take. The two are different. Um, but moving moving swiftly on, uh, Hippocrates ha uh, and his writings had a huge effect on on the origins of uh, medicine in that it stresses the importance of observation um, and the importance of looking at the patient um, as a human being, as a way of trying to determine what's wrong with them. Um, his we'll go into his oath in, in fact you know what we'll, I'll, we'll start it off with with the oath because i actually read through it and it is you know what i actually quite like it it's quite i don't know it's it just interesting to read any kind there's definitely, of definitely there's definitely some points in there which um mm. which yeah, yeah they're, they're, it's they're not very, all of it's followed today they're very poignant um, they're very poignant and you yeah, can see that it's about it. the development of knowledge mm. <clears throat> the sharing of knowledge um accepting that you don't always know everything but that somebody else will um, and using the best knowledge that's available to you not necessarily your own um, for the betterment of any patient that comes into your care yeah, absolutely um, so I guess we'll uh, I'll talk briefly about um, okay so other than the hippo uh, yeah, Hippocratic Oath, which is possibly my favourite part of my favourite part of Hippocrates' legacy. Um, he also brought uh, humoral medicine. Um, humoral medicine is um, the idea 
uh, or it's basically treating disease and deficiencies within the body through the belief of um, that the body is mostly made up of um, a number of liquids or the four humors. Weirdly enough, um, this again, humoral medicine also existed in uh, India and China um, and was around uh, is in the Islamic world as well. well. We'll go into that in a moment though, as it's not a strict divide between um, Greek and although there is there is a divide, but there isn't, if that makes sense. Like, there is a divide between Greek and Persian cultures, but a lot of knowledge was obviously shared, and a lot of smart people, what I love what I love to see, seem to ha be able to get over um, the early difficulties of language and cultural barriers and still share knowledge, um, which is, is fantastic. Um, right, but anyway, um, humor, humor, or go on. I'm just, I'm mispronouncing everything. <laughs> You're all good. Humoral medicine is the idea. We're going to focus on the four because that's the most. That was the most widely accepted. Although, again, there was some people, um, even in ancient Greece or ancient Ionia, would say that there were as many as eleven different humors. Um, the four different humours are each connected with one of the four elements. Um, yellow bile being fire, uh, black bile being earth, phlegm being water, and blood uh, being air. Blood being hot and wet, yellow bile being hot and dry for fire, uh, black bile being dry and cold for earth, uh, and phlegm just being cold and wet. Um, the reason why, I, t I tell you what, what, uh, the, okay, so we now know the body is more than this. So, and I don't want to be like, and I don't want to like just state the questions of, oh, why do you think these idiots fell for this when you know, like they were just, just they were doing the best they flipping could. Absolutely. Like, why, why, why do, why do you think? I, I don't actually have an answer to this. Well, I do and I don't, because I don't think my answer to this actually satisfies it. But why do you think humoral medicine was as popular as it was? I think it was based on um, what was clearly visible um, in and out of the body, um, and then knowing that most life itself is satisfied through fluids um, therefore if you can keep the fluids in balance then I suppose the theory was that if the fluids were in balance then the body would be in balance well that's that's exactly it yeah like a lot of ancient um, a lot of ancient natural philosophers realise the importance of fluid um they noticed that there was a mixture within the world, and they also, um, yeah, you know what, you, you hit the nail on the head there, Nick, um, when it came to uh, if different illnesses would produce different, I don't know, different excretions from the body. Yeah, I mean, um, I know one thing. I know one therapy that they they quite often, one of the most famous old timey therapies was. Um, the cleansing of the blood, um, either mm. through leaching or through bloodletting, um, and this is one of those practices that was based around humoric medicine, um, where it's just trying to bring balance to one of the fluids. In this case, like if there's a fever, a hot blood, then they would let the blood in order to try and bring balance to that fluid exactly it and that's exactly right um yeah the reason why bloodletting uh was a thing was with fever um it would be seen as there was there was too much blood so it was just the hopes of removing removing that bloodletting 
oh sorry through bloodletting removing uh that type of uh humor in the hopes that it would bring the rest of the body into balance rather than robbing the body of a needed resource um yeah yeah absolutely yeah absolutely uh yeah absolutely yeah absolutely right once again um they you know like getting getting a mixture or relieving pressure within the body does seem to be a thing in old medicine um drilling holes in people's heads trepanning um there you go fantastic i'm glad you remembered the name of it because i'd forgotten <laughs> i remember uh... it from uh, his dark materials um the books by um philip pullman um one of the characters in that has trepanning um performed on his skull by some shamans mm -hmm. does it help him they honestly don't, they don't oh. really go on about how whether it helps to be fair trepanning is based around a theory which is exclusive to the uh to the books so as much as it's a practice that genuinely took place um and probably still does take place in certain parts of the world um, it wasn't necessarily based around the practices as to why they would use trepanning. It was a fictional um, adaptation. Okay, that's that's interesting. Well, once again, um, kind of highlighting the importance of um, education, even in fiction. Um, well, one of the one of the um, things that interested me is that uh trepanning was picked up briefly um in the 1800s um by uh by a french man whose name i can't remember another source would also be the podcast sawbones uh with justin mcelroy and his wife, who's a doctor and is incredibly intelligent, and the fact that I can't remember her name is just... Oh, that's, that's really going to annoy me now. Um, we'll call her Dr. McElroy. <clears throat> yep, let's let's go with that. Um, but she... Yeah, like, kind of goes into this, this massive... Uh, or gives a really good, in-depth um, explanation of this. Uh, a lot of people thought trepanning, or not a lot of people, a couple of people who you could argue come under the term quacks, um, uh, believed that trepanning could release pressure or um, allow you to achieve enlightenment. Um, what I do like is that the one guy who came up with this theory didn't, you know, he did it to other people. But he didn't just do it to other people. He did it to himself. He trepanned himself. Okay. He then what got it, he then got institutionalized as a result. But you know, at least he wasn't like, "Oh, I'm going to do this to other people." My but question, secretly. My question mm -hmm. is, did he do it to himself first? That bit I can't remember. The reason being um, is that there's a couple of points really. It, it would make me feel better if his practice run was on himself, morally. However, it also makes it me wasn't. question the judgment of others uh. allowing a bloke with a hole in his head to drill a hole in their head. <laughs> well, to be fair, if the person with a hole in their head seemed to be... I don't, I'm going to be honest with you. If there was a bunch of people with hole in their head, with holes in their heads, who seemed happier, more collective, more emotionally uh, resilient and resourceful, and genuinely more intelligent, I'd consider it. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to say I'd definitely go put my hand up and so sign sign me up to the cult. cult but like, I, I definitely would. I don't know. I mean, I'd, yeah. There's definitely something that makes me feel a little bit queasy about it. It's like the um, the uh, the practices that were undertaken by mental health institutions in the U.S., um, like the ice picking, where they aimed an ice pack ice pick up the inside of the eye um, to try and disconnect a specific part of the brain. I can't remember which part now, 
Um, uh, lich, the famous ice pick lobotomy. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the frontal lobe, isn't it? They're trying to d- disconnect the frontal lobe. Um, and oh, just the thought of that practice makes me close my eyes on the spot. Um, and sometimes if I'm like having one of those lucid moments, I, I'm, I even feel, find myself like drilling my, eye, my hands into my eyes. Oh, it makes me twitch, makes me cringe. It's horrible. Like the idea of... I, um, I worked in a neurological rehab um, once as a care worker um, and there was a chap that I looked after, no names named obviously, um, who was bottled on a train and um, he, part of his treatment was that he had to have part of his skull cut away by the doctors to relieve pressure on his brain um, because his brain swelled up. Um, so it is still it's not necessarily trepanning, but it's definitely the release of pressure um, on the vital organ of the brain. Um, but obviously it was for a different practice. So in this case, it was to, as I said, relieve pressure on the brain. Um, previously, it was to to allow the, the, the demons out and the, the, the Holy Spirit in, as it were. No, that's... Yeah. Well, that, that's... Oh, it's, inter- it's interesting that... Um, that it's still done um, at all. Um, no, bringing back to... Uh, I shouldn't have gone in. I shouldn't have gone into that. But it's surprising that with medical history, it's not just a straight line, and it's also really surprising that after Hippocrates, there's one figure who then brings things forward a little bit, and then for a long, a huge amount of time, just things don't progress. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But for now, um. Let's take a look at the uh, the modern version of the Hippocratic Oath. Um, I've gone with the modern version because the old one um, speaks. Well, you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. It go it. It's very very Greek. Um, I think anybody who's not of ancient Greece would would struggle with it simply because it starts by praising Apollo, the physician. Um, and it, you know, mentions a number of the other gods from the Greek pantheon. Um, this, the version we're looking at, would be the revised version, which was revised, um, believe it or not, as late as the 1960s. Um, and th- there's still debate about whether this document or this oath is relevant, but a number of physicians still see it as a rite of passage. And... As you've said, it's got a number of poignant points in it, so uh, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna go through it. Just so it's not, I'm gonna be honest with you, mate. How would you feel? Because I, because I sent this to you, and it's on the chat that we're sharing, and I've spent too much time speaking already. How would you feel about reading it out? Would yeah, you sure. be okay with that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, yeah, great. I will, yeah, so I'll read it out now. Um, It says, I swear to fulfill, to the best of my ability and judgment, this covenant. I will respect the hard-won scientific gains of those physicians in whose steps I walk and gladly share such knowledge as as is mine with those who are to follow. I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required avoiding those twin traps of over-treatment and therapeutic nihilism. I will remember that there is art to medicine as well as science, and that warmth, sympathy and understanding may outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. I will not be ashamed to say I know not, nor will I fail to call in my colleagues when the skills of another are needed for a patient's recovery. I will respect the privacy of my patients, for their problems are not disclosed to me that the world might know. Most especially must I tread with care in matters of life and death. If it is given me to save a life, all thanks, but it may also be within my power to take a life. This awesome responsibility must be faced with great humbleness and awareness of my own frailty. 
Above all, I must not play at God. I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart, a cancerous growth, but a sick human being whose illness may affect the person's family and economic stability. My responsibility includes these related problems if I am to care adequately for the sick. I will prevent disease wherever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. I will remain, remember that I remain a member of society with special obligations to all my fellow human beings, those sound of mind and body as well as the infirm. If I do not violate this oath, may I enjoy life and art, respected while I live and remembered with affection thereafter. May I also act so as to preserve the finest traditions of my calling, and may I long experience the joy of healing those who seek my help. Okay. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, that was the that is the revised um and slightly altered hippocratic oath um please note that although although the first bit of the praising apollo has been removed the main body of the text is still for the most part the same and a number of the points that are made although they sound incredibly modern are, are just translations translations of things that were said even at the time um yeah one thing that blows me away is just again the, the like holistic medicine quite often sounds almost like alternative medicine but it's about looking at the whole person and the Hippo uh, the Hippocratic Oath really, in my mind, seems to to stress that. And it's I'm sure there are problems in there. And um I'm sure if I looked at it with a fine tooth chrome, I could find a couple of bits to debate on. But for the most part, I find it very difficult to disagree with a what seems to be a wholeheartedly best attempt at I will do my best to be humble, to cure people, to consider all the outcomes and not to be a dick. It's really hard to to disagree with that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. What are your feelings on it? <clears throat> I think there's a lot of responsibility um throughout that um through that throughout that oath. Um I think it's it's strange how um like strange to think that every um doctor is expected to take the Hippocratic Oath um, and yet I have had doctors which um, this isn't exclusive to all doctors please note um, but there are doctors out there that are almost arrogant um, in their demeanour which is almost contradictory to the um, like the oath in its in its own entirety, like it clearly says, like you are a member of of society. Um, yes, you have special obligations, but you are still a human being. You are just one with knowledge that can help others, um, and as such, have responsibility to do so. Um, it, it, like it doesn't say in there you are better than other people because you have the ability to save lives. Um, but. I like the uh, I like the points about um, obviously respecting privacy of patients. That's something that um, has obviously been in there since um, since the day dot. Um, I thought it was quite a, quite a new thing with the um, like the confidentiality confident, confidentiality act um, and whatnot else. But it's obviously been in there a lot longer for doctors. Um, the uh, the looking for knowledge in other people as i said earlier in the podcast um, when you don't necessarily know something yourself accepting that and saying yeah you know what i don't know i will um i will ask somebody for help um i think everybody can take a little bit from from the hippocratic oath in their own right absolutely like i love um 
the balance of I will apply the benefit um, uh, of the of the sick. Sorry, I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required, avoiding the twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. Just yeah, I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm not gonna treat for the sake of treating. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just oh, also just the really, ba really basic thing. I will not be ashamed to say, I, d I don't know, I know not, or nor will I fail to call in my colleagues when it's needed for a patient's recovery. Like that's yeah, I think um, it's a like I see a lot of um, like the development of knowledge and the acceptance that knowledge is going to change over time, and and accepting that knowledge is going to change over time and develop over time um is is part and parcel of being a doctor what what you treat the way you treat today may well change in 10 15 years don't get stuck on old ways if if there are better methods and and more holistic methods that are implemented um as time goes by mm. no that's it Okay, so unfortunately, I think this is a certain thing that I could go through for a while, but I am just going to get get moving on. Um, okay, so this is the oath that Hippocrates, his corpus or his body of work put down. Um, there is a lot of problems with the um, uh, textual criticism. Of Hippocrates because the dates on all of the documents within the corpus spread over a time scale which seems unrealistic for a person to have lived um, there's some yeah some people uh, yeah some people say that a number of documents in the corpus were were added or altered by members of the Hippocratic movement um, who weren't Hippocrates himself, but were the students of the people who um, took stuff from his writing, and then they've just applied his name to their stuff as their stuff was inspired by his stuff. See, I um, find that quite frustrating. Um, it, mm. I, it's quite subjective to to implement that as a a um, negative point on his works based on hypothetical knowledge of of well, he, he, there's no way that he could have existed for that long or at that time or, or whatever um like you this was two and a half thousand years ago like you you don't know and i use the proverbial you of course um and it, it like one one thing that remind um it reminds me of quite heavily is the um is the king's list in ancient egypt um pre-dynastic kings um, listed to have lived for thousands of years and and people now are like oh it's, it's just it's mythological it's it's completely hypothetical i'm not saying it existed but what i am saying is that you have no place to say it didn't because this is thousands and thousands of years ago there's no way that you can know how things have changed um and how time is maybe maybe perceived differently or or there's any hypothetical scenario that could change the way that they were recording um, kings on the kings list, or even um, what enabled may or may have enabled um, Hippocrates to um, live uh, beyond his um, his fellow peers' years. You know. Yeah, that's abs that's absolutely fair. Um, although you can prop up a lot of bad theories with that argument that argument that you've made in and of itself is entirely true like um we don't know when it comes to second hand information it's uh it's very difficult to judge at all um perhaps i shouldn't have said anything but i was just uh yeah no, just going you were right to you were right to you were right to um to show both sides um, mm. uh, I, all I was doing was um, offering my my perspective on that. I think it's quite important to hear both sides, but not necessarily to offer um, an objective opinion um, for or against. Um, I think it's important to um, listen. 
more than no, anything. That's, that's, the the important that's... part, I think, that that people seem to miss because of X and Y hypothetical fact is is actually the writings and the teachings, which is um, more than anything the bit that we should be listening to, not the hows and whys and whens. Like, look at what was written. That's the bit that was was. Um, like that that's was... that's the bit that's primary like yeah, exactly, the, the yeah. how the hows and whens is secondary and can perhaps give you further insight but in order to have a further insight you first must have basic understanding yeah is that what you're saying yeah yeah okay cool all right well um moving forward um about 500 uh years or so um we come to a person who is yeah, although Hippocrates is like the seen as the father of medicine, um, this individual had a huge influence on all scientific. Well, I say all scientific, scientific, um, humorous or humoral medicine at mm. least. Um, <clears throat> this guy's name was weird enough. He was a Roman, and he seems to be one of the. Um, you know what? I've I've poo pooed Rome a little bit in the past because it turns out a lot of the pre Socrates came up with a lot of their stuff, and then yeah, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were all from the Greek city states rather than rather than Roman. And I mean, even that's, the that's Romans to be expected by... when you've got a global um, mm. empire. Like you're going to assimilate knowledge and then try to take um not try to lay claim to it wherever possible just to validate um your existence and your reign as a as a global empire um but I don't think it's a reason to to disregard um or or go against Romans in general mm. I will say though that this is what kind of like this is what really surprised me um, because although Rome assimilated uh, knowledge and took several parts of several other cultures, um, like although they're they're administrative and um, conquer and conquestal achievements are incredible when it comes to what what stuff they made they didn't really invent or make much um they reproduced i guess is what i was going whereas what's really surprising is that with claudius galen he was a roman and he made a shit ton of stuff like he was a he was a physician um he i don't know how he lived but he never charged a fee um, he healed people from all walks of life. Um, he start well. He was both a physician and uh, and a surgeon and an apothecary, which is weirdly enough where you get the term general practitioner from, because those three professions, um, up until recent times, were seen as entirely separate. Um, well, no, you, you, I suppose even now you still, I know you get GPs, which are your general doctors, but you get mm. specialists and they tend to specialise in those three areas. You get chemists and you get, you get surgeons and you get um, like phys, physici, uh, phys, well, I can't even think of the right word. Um, physicians. Physicians, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, physicians were seen as kind of like the high and mighty doctors. Surgeons were seen almost as butchers, and apothecaries were quite often seen as mystics. Yeah. Um, Shard. Uh, it's yeah, no, but it's it's interesting that you do. This guy was all of those. He healed lots and lots of people, but the thing that sets him apart is that he wrote over six hundred t- treatises over the course of his life, and unlike. Uh, Hippocrates, Galen's writings. Um, I, you know what? I can't even quote the numbers. I don't know the numbers. I just know all of the the subtext from what I've read. Seems to be that they are all more clearly 
directly associated with him and are believed or are believed with less dispute or um discernment like they all just people go yeah this is this this is all him um he wrote he so he wrote 600 treatises the um the amount that he wrote uh was over double uh the Harry Potter franchise um which although that doesn't not necessarily sound particularly um impressive nowadays at a time when every single page cost you money ink was expensive and all of this was scientific um observation of different types of disease and different types of humoral medicine it's an incredible achievement yeah absolutely um, absolutely the reason why though and this is something which this, this is something which bothered me and it's I, I feel i've got to be honest about it but um it's something that i don't don't necessarily like is that what we have of ancient history and ancient science and ancient everything is solely what's been preserved and what's been preserved has been it's been very selective like i don't know if there were better philosophers than the the seven sages of ancient greece and i don't know if there were better doctors than galen um all i know is that this is what has survived the reason why um galen the reason why galen's knowledge um was kind of unchallenged and was adopted um for well over a thousand years like his work literally lasted for a thousand years and and people didn't advance further for a couple of different reasons but unfortunately part of it is um the fact that his writings were very popular in amongst the catholic church um his because he because um galen when looking at the human body realizing how all the systems work together he was a humorous uh humoral doctor but he also dissected animals um because human dissection was seen as abhorrent to the greeks and to later the mm, to a point the roman and then to the to christendom um with uh dissection only being legalized in uh 1480s by uh the pope at the time can't remember which which one it was though but until 1480 80s in most christian roman greek countries dissection in and of itself was illegal so if somebody caught you doing an autopsy autopsy they'd almost treat you you know like a murderer like you were doing a crime so because of that everybody had very limited knowledge they missed a um, trick they... there. <clears throat> you think of the uh, the conquest of the Roman Empire, how many wars they must have had. The physicians should have just been with the generals up on the up on the hill, waiting for the end of the uh, battle, and then just go down and see what was left. It's interesting that you say that. You know what? I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do this all in the wrong order. But you, the fact that you've said that brings up a really interesting fact. You're right. You're absolutely right. It wasn't until um, the hospital, the large number of hospitals in France opened that this use of um, observation and large numbers of dead was used as a form of scientific, um, as a way of mass gathering of knowledge and of um, autopsies um, through, the, through the hospitals in Paris um, in the 1800s uh medical professionals would do their best to treat patients with whatever they had at the time which was very very limited and then when they died they'd cut them open and find out what was wrong afterwards but you're right they could have done it so much earlier like so much earlier considering the huge amount of death that the the romans dealt out well not just the romans the greeks were guilty of it too um, mm. 
of while well, they were warring against each other all exactly the time. there was there was the opportunities there for accidental observations <laughs> of the internals of the human body mm. No, you're absolutely right. I wonder if well, soldiers well, knew more about the inside of the human body than surgeons did. Well, surgeons cut did cut people open, so but I would argue that surgeons would know more about the internals of a body than a, a physician or a apothecary for sure. You know, mm. um, weirdly enough, uh, just another interesting fact which kind of got me: Plato figured out. Um, that the brain is where thoughts and feelings happened. Um, Aristotle debunked him by, because he was a bit of a, sens well, this is possibly unfair, a bit of a sensationalist, and he pointed out that when you're truly frightened or when you're truly in love, it's the heart which changes, like the, the beating of the heart physically changes. So he thought that feelings must come from the heart, which is why you got that. But it was it goes back to Galen, who then, through dissection and a few weird, few more of his weirder experiments, uh, proved that I can't remember how, but he proved that it was the brain again. And yet, probably through despite... the discovery of the nervous system, if I'm honest. You see well, that he... interconnection of, of like cables running from the brain um, to everything else in the body. You kind of yeah. left with a, at least a hypothesis that that it's the computer of the the body, as it were. That's it. Like you can That's understand it. both as well, really, if you think like the physiology uh, physiological reaction to like. Um, the adrenal gland kicking in um like that and the uh the fluttering of the heart when when you, you see um something that something that you fancy um you can understand um the idea that it came from that end but likewise you see think taste and smell um all from the top of your body so you can also understand Plato's mentality of, um, like the brain being the the hub, the central hub. Yeah, no, that's yeah, that's it's, it's fair enough, isn't it? Um, weirdly enough, uh, just to uh, once again kind of. Um, okay, so you had Galen. In up, uh, Galen died in about uh, 216 AD. Um, things got a little bit more chaotic. The Roman Empire broke down. Um, it went massively into decline, and the Byzantine Empire was also kind of almost. There were a couple of times when it was reclaimed and stuff, but it was mostly declined. Things became chaotic. Um, and. It, Based on our other discussions and our other discussions throughout like history and stuff, can you guess where a lot of the a lot of uh Hippocrates's and Galen's writings where they ended up going when they became more when they became rare during the Dark Ages, uh when, you know, the old books started just falling apart, the knowledge was lost, the money wasn't there to make new books. Where, where do you think they, they went? Where do, I where would do you assume think they were reproduced? That it, I would assume that it went to the Vatican City. Okay. There was some stuff in the Vatican, for sure. Um, for sure. Weirdly enough, um, you, you're along the right lines, but... Uh, Think about what other monotheistic uh, religion, or in this case, both religion and government, kind of rivaled that of Catholicism. So, like um, Mecca, that kind of. I can't think of the right place. No, you, you're thinking along the right lines. It's Islam, man. Islam, yeah. Yeah. Like um, Islam, and once again, like it's really weird when you think about it. Today, Baghdad. When you think about Baghdad, you just think of 
kind of well I, this is really bad but i'll just say what i think of i think of war i think of saddam hussein i think of just kind of i know this is really bad but the only images i've seen of it are during wartime yeah and yeah, yet Baghdad you see was... the um you see the propaganda that is portrayed to um give that feeling of 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 desolation and destruction and but Baghdad is probably one of like one of the fewest um nations of the old um old history uh, old human history that still exists um but history, absolutely but um like archaeological sites have been destroyed over the years and their history itself has been destroyed um so all that is left is the sandy desolation that you see um, portrayed on the news um now but yeah it, it's absolutely amazing um or it would have been pre um pre war time mm. well this is it like medina and and baghdad were the places where um yeah, where Islamic scholars um, who had their own medical um, traditions um, and their own ways of of doing things, like um, in Western, you've got in Western uh, medicine, you have uh, the laboratory and you've got the hospital mm. um, and the two are often separate. Uh, there were a number of hospitals which also acted as centers of of learning all throughout the Islamic Golden Age. Yeah. Um, additionally, um, in Baghdad, there was one place uh, I can't. I'm not even gonna. I, I know this is really bad. I'm not gonna try. No, I'll try. Biat al Halmaka, uh, which translates as House of Wisdom, was um, a library in Baghdad which had just had it it was weird that they they translated they got hold of books from their own conquests they translated them into arabic and then several hundred years later they translated them back into latin and yeah and like it's so it's kind of really interesting that um yeah the uh, the islamic nation um kind of safe safeguarded a lot of scientific knowledge when it was just kind of being well the dark uh, ages were the dark ages were exactly that they were dark mm. weren't they so much was burnt and destroyed i think one of the safest places it possibly could be is within the islamic faiths absolutely okay well moving quickly on um okay so one thing um i one thing i will say is Galen was Galen's work was challenged by um a number of both western and um and islamic physicians but nothing nothing ever changed simply because of his popularity um and because of you know his work didn't always his cures didn't always work, but they were the best they had at the time, and it was difficult to go against it. There was it kind of it. His work was good, but it also had snowballed into popularity, and that popularity had almost become a fanaticism uh, within, yeah, within even uh, intellectual people. So it's weird that uh, it was um, the person who disproved. Uh, humoral medicine uh, was a, a gentleman called William Harvey. Uh, you may recognise that name as uh, the hospital in our local area um, being named after him. Yeah, uh, he was a gentleman who he he dissected a lot of animals. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure what he what he did for humans, but he dissected a lot of animals, looked at the uh, at the different organs, and then actually started doing mathematical equations. Um, it was believed in humoral medicine that the way digestion worked is that food was 
transferred into a particular chemical, which was then turned directly into blood. Um, Willie, uh, Sir William Harvey did the did the maths for it, and he found out that our blood Russell blood vessels would uh, literally rupture if that was the case. And he, it, it's really interesting that he used maths in order to kind of in order to prove his point. Um, which is why he was able... Well, that's one of the small things he did. He also discovered the circulatory system um, and did a number of things to do with the heart. Um, moving quickly on, uh, after William Harvey, um, things started to... Uh, yeah, things started to progress in um, medicine. Weirdly enough, it wasn't England... Uh, where a lot, although the, hmm, no, okay, I'm actually skipping ahead. Okay, right. Can you, can you tell me when was the first um, vaccine? Oh God, <clears throat> I would have thought that the first vaccination would have taken place. Um... 18th century you, you you're close is that 1800s or 1700 1700 18th century is the 1700s yeah okay you you're you're actually right you got the right century it's towards the end of that century though okay. it's uh, 1796 was the first vaccine um was it the same do you know if it was the same like structure of vaccine now where they, they, they obviously vaccinate you with um, essentially a dead part of the virus. Um, whatever Similar. it is. Yeah. Well, so, okay, so this is the weird thing, and this is where I'm going to get into it, because although I'm going to be honest with you, it was a rivalry between two um, two doctors, two medical, well, two, um, two amazing uh, scientists and doctors, one from France, one from Germany, who brought about germ theory and brought about the mainstead of vaccines. But the first one was done by um, an English gentleman called, I think, have I written Edward? So many of my notes are badly written here. Um, Edward Jenner, who noticed, so at the time, um, smallpox was the most deadly disease mm. um, ravaging Europe. Uh, in Europe alone, it was killing 400,000 people uh, a year. Uh, this disease reached even the nobility with five notable monarchs, I haven't remembered their names, um, succumbing to it uh, over the course of a, of 100 years. Um, it was just ravaging everywhere. The one set of people who, and so this is the thing, this was just basic observation, the one set of people who never seemed to die from smallpox and never seemed to get smallpox was the milkmaids. Such a weird observation. Yeah. But that's that's what was going on. And then, um, and then Jenna noticed, although the milkmaids didn't ever seem to die of smallpox or ever seem to get smallpox a number of them did have blisters on their hands with sores which looked slightly similar to smallpox and from that from that one observation he started thinking that okay well the things they've got on their hands are cowpox so if everyone who gets cowpox doesn't seem to die from smallpox, what, you know, what is the worst thing to get? And if I, if I inject somebody with cowpox, cowpox, will that make them immune to smallpox? Now the bloke, he didn't have, he had some resources, but he didn't have all the resources in the world. And... It was a fairly solid theory because he'd seen he'd 
he'd noticed this for a number of years and it was it had been noticed by the mainstead of society although it, you know it wasn't a conclusion it was just yeah oh, milkmaids it's, it's don't yeah yeah just it, you know it was an oddity it was a huh that's weird move on so he did something which has produced incredibly good results but in and of itself if it had have gone badly would have been an evil act but there's there's uh there's risk everywhere what he did is he took the child of his gardener and injected them with cowpox jeez yeah and this Talk this, about now, take this is... the take the bull by the horns yeah, well, he took the bull by the horns. It's also annoying. I, I know this is really bad, but just like just like yourself when we were talking about um, trepanning, he didn't do it to himself. He didn't do it to a member of his family. He did it to an indebted servant of his family, which is just a little bit of a... Right, but you know what? I'm... One, I don't have time I'll, to go into the I'll moral morality it. of that. Yeah, I'll test it on somebody who's expendable kind of mentality. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. That's the bit that I really struggle mm. with. But it, I can't... This is the thing that I can't deny. I can't deny the results of it. I yeah. can't deny... But that, you can't that, justify that little... the end by the means. Yeah, no. Ab oh, that, okay, you know what? That in itself is another podcast yeah yeah um right okay so just really quickly um the kid's name was uh james fibs and he so this is the thing he was injected with cowpox so he's already injected the kid with a disease once several months later he injects him with smallpox the just, disease which is ravaging just to test whether everywhere. or not he was right or not just to test whether he was right or not <sighs> yeah not not ideal not more, very you know what if if it I wasn't will, for the result i would call it a dick move i will remember that i do not treat a fever chart or a cancerous growth but a yeah. sick human <laughs> being <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It goes against the Hippocratic Oath massively. This is the this is the thing, though. It worked. By injecting people with a small amount of, of cowpox, it made them immune okay. uh, to smallpox. Well, I'm, and I'm... so he did, and so and so he did it with other people, and he did it with people who weren't children, and he did it with people who weren't this, weren't that, weren't that, and then my all question of a sudden, is. My question is, did the kid get autism? That's, that's not recorded. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Um, I don't think so. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not recorded and he probably would have been apprenticed and been a gardener. I reckon he would have been fine. Just to yeah, clarify for anybody that was offended there, I'm also autistic, so <laughs> don't think for a minute that I actually believe that. Um <laughs> yeah, um, but that was the first one, and that was the first vaccine, or the first successful vaccine in 1796. Um, yeah, I, I, I do find it somewhat hypocritical that um, Jenna knowingly injected a child with two diseases and lucked out and you know, is acclaimed with awards, yet Typhoid Mary just went around her business working as working as a servant, and yet because she was a carrier of a disease, was sentenced to prison. You know, I just but anyway, that's a, again that's another thing. Right, but did you did you know that although that became a vaccine can you guess the amount of time it took for another vaccine to be discovered? Oh, at least a uh, hundred years. Mate, you are on it today. Well done. <laughs> All right. Yeah, not quite, but pretty flipping close. I would have expected like five years. You know, I've been spoiled by the, by the speed of modern progression. 89 years. Yeah. 
89 years of we've got a cure for we've got a cure for smallpox we inject you with a bit of cowpox all right can you guess the can you guess the disease that was was next cured by vaccination i'm going to go with the flu it's not quite no not okay. quite um it was rabies oh oh yeah they came out with a with a vaccination for rabies next on the list it was then and it's weird you had you had smallpox and then it was 89 years and then you've got the two um the two medical giants which is uh louis pasteur and robert uh Kroc. um and their their rivalry produced germ theory um, and produced a number of vaccines and a number of just oh and pasteurized milk, um, which Louis Pasteur um, fastest milk could. in the world. Well, you can make it. Uh, you can make or just kind of show that because of microbes, things go wrong. So if you pasteur if you heat something and pasteurize it, then it lasts longer. Um, which apparently saved the French economy at the time. But anyway, um, it was those two who then started uh, working kind of against, working not side by side, but as rivals against each other, making all kinds of discover discoveries. Uh, kind of the kind of uh, the Tesla and Edison of of medicine. That's exactly it. Yeah, they didn't like each other. But they their work was at the same time they did address each other. It was cordial and awkward at times. Um, yeah, it was. It's just interesting that you had you had smallpox, then nothing happened. Then you had rabies, followed by cholera, followed by uh, typhoid. And then they, then they, yeah, then they vac, then they created a vaccine for the plague. Um, so those were the first five things to be cured. Uh, or those were the first things which were, or the first vaccines that were invented. But there was an eighty-nine uh, years gap between the first and the second. Oh dear! Right, okay. Uh, running out of time now, but we'll just go through. Um, those yeah those two things so I, I also found it interesting that you had louis uh, pasteur and robert uh Koch, uh literally researching going against each other uh, you had a number of other um theories whereas people thought that diseases created microbes and germs rather than germs causing diseases um people had loads of ideas for you know like it, it it was known that if somebody's sick, isolation sometimes is a good idea, uh, which you get from just a number like things like leprosy, where people would be ostracized from the community uh, simply to stop the disease spreading. Um, yeah, uh, Louis Pasteur um, was an amazing scientist uh, and did did a lot of did a lot of good things um but his methods he would ignore evidence which didn't support his theories which isn't great whereas robert uh robert cock um his scientific theories and the way that he did things was better but the experiments that he did uh were also somewhat well you know what like maybe it's wrong to just look at things through this way but he literally took anthrax and injected it into rats uh yeah i mean there's a means <laughs> yeah there's a way of doing things i suppose yeah like that's it i mean <laughs> it's just it pays the both... rats back for the black death doesn't it <laughs> You know, you know what? I hadn't thought about it that way. I hadn't <laughs> thought about it that way. Maybe, maybe. Okay, but you had um, so with Jenner the first uh, vaccine being seventeen ninety six. Then you had 
germ theory kind of really being worked on, but uh, you had it being created in 1880, or you had it really being cemented in 1885. Uh, you had um, carbolic uh, disinfectant or carbolic soap being mass produced in 18. Uh, 59. Uh, this might not seem like a massive thing, but before that time, a lot of surgeons wouldn't bother washing their hands. In fact, if anything, they wouldn't bother washing their tools because they thought that the more blood that was stained on their things, it showed it showed to the uninitiated that they knew what they were doing because they'd cut and cut people open before. Oh, the so, naivety of arrogance. Yeah, yeah. So, like you know. Ah oh, well, look. You can you can see that surgeon over there with the, the rusty saw. He's far more experienced and knows what he's doing so much more. I mean, much safer, better hands. Yeah, knows exactly how to pass tetanus onto the <laughs> onto the next person. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so you had carbolic soap um, and just a hygiene revolution in the 1800s or 19th century that saved a huge number of lives. Um, yeah, just going quickly through a couple of other, uh, couple of other dates here. The first X-ray was in 1897. Uh, um, weirdly enough, that wasn't by Mary Curie, uh, who I thought was the first person to use X-rays, but she was the first person to organise and distribute uh, X-rays to the French troops during the First World War. And she also discovered palladium, which was later... You know what, I'm not even going to go into how it was used because it's disgust, uh, disgusting how it was used. But she did a lot of stuff, but it wasn't her who originally did the first X-ray. Um, uh, after the, During this time, things started to move far more drastically as modern medicine was... Uh, kind of really came into its fruition. Um, the first insulin shot was in 1922 and a kid who had type 1 diabetes who normally only li would live for months lived an additional 13 years as a result of that um i think they the... covered that didn't they in um uh, call the midwife my partner my my wife watches oh, really? call the midwife and i believe they they covered the first insulin shot in call the midwife that's interesting because I thought it was set in the sick. You know what? Call the Midwife has actually stretched over generations at this point, so that is quite possible. Um, penicillin was uh, discovered in, or was yeah discovered and made in nineteen forty-two. Yeah, he locked himself then... in a room for I think it was a month until he made a discovery. The bloke that came up with penicillin. Um, by which time mould had started to grow on his plates and food and he started to investigate that. I mean, you know what? Dedication, I guess. He was he was um, like, I am I'm going to make a discovery. I don't care how long it takes, I will be in this room until I make a discovery and well, what can I say? He did it. He did it. That's fair enough. Um, the NHS was also founded um, in 1940. Uh, yeah, was also founded in 1948, which is where I'm going to stop uh, the kind of just veil of um, successes. But the NHS was uh, produced mostly out. Well, before. Okay, so before the NHS, we there was uh, the National Insurance Act which covered working men um, for their health care if, if you were a man, if you worked and if you were providing for a family you would get free health care if you're a woman you wouldn't if you were a child you wouldn't if you were elderly and no longer working you wouldn't you might see the problem with that yeah yeah. 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 I so. mean, I mean, it's not quite Inuit when when um, when the elderly um, are deemed beyond their use um, in the old Inuit uh, ways. 
they would just move them outside. Yeah. Uh, it's terrible to yeah, it's terrible to think, isn't it? But like with um yeah, well the National Insurance Act was yeah, was incomplete. Um so the NHS was founded as troops returned from the Second World War who they they you know, they felt they had a sense of entitlement, which to be fair they should have. They fought for a country and for a government. They fought uh they fought hard, they saw a lot of horrible things and they came back and they expected um to be looked after by the England that they had fought for. Likewise, um a lot of people who ha well sorry, a lot of women who had fought or who who had like worked in the munitions factories and done a lot of the jobs that needed to be done whilst the blokes were away at war. Likewise, had contributed to the war effort, and therefore felt there was this growing sense of entitlement in amongst the people of England that health care should be covered by the government. And so, um, even within a conservative government, there was a scheme that was produced, and then within a coalition government, the NHS was put forward. Uh, originally, the NHS uh, covered England and Wales and not yet Scotland, um, but later kind of rose to do this. Um, I'm... Yeah, before we get into the problems with the modern pharmaceutical companies and with the NHS in its present time, I am at least... For all its problems, I am at least glad that the NHS exists. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely with any, you on that. Yeah, just the fact that it do, it, should, it doesn't, although with the forms, uh, you know what, I won't even go down that way. No matter who you are, you can seek medical aid and advice. Um, like, there's a, a really good video uh, that I started watching didn't get to the end to before this um and it was an address from the conservative health minister uh laying out what the nhs would be and i'm gonna be honest with you it was it was a huge promise it was a massive promise and i i, I also was surprised by despite the fact that the the, uh, the film was from the 1940s and it was a conservative health minister it was completely legible and completely down to earth and frank it was a this will be available you don't have to use it if you don't want to no one's going to force you to but this is available now you will be able to see a doctor for care there will be no charge for any of this any consultations there will be, you know, and it was just, it was actually kind of really inspiring to see. Um, yeah, it was a good speech, is all I can say on that. All right, finally, before we stop, uh, do you have any any favourite stories of medical mishaps or medical breakthroughs? Um, no, I think I think my my favourite story, as I said earlier in the podcast, is how penicillin was uh, was. Um, found in like stumbled across and it was the determination of the chap i can't even remember his name now who alexander fleming yeah fleming who um it was his grim determination he set out to um make a discovery he wasn't even sure what di discovery he would make and yet he um locked himself away until he found penicillin um which I thought was incredible um, and hilarious at the same time. Could you imagine somebody going, I'm going to make a discovery and then locking themselves away? Like the thought is preposterous. It is, but like I, the, the annoying thing is geniuses often are preposterous, you know, but the problem is the only difference between someone who's wrecked. Well, often the only difference between uh, someone who's recognised as a genius and somebody who looks like a crazy person is just that proven 
usefulness mm. or that proven markable achievement up until they have that every genius is just passed aside as weird so i don't know I, maybe uh, yeah but you, it is i definitely i don't think i would discover anything quite as useful as penicillin if i locked myself in a room i yeah i don't know maybe i'm not yeah i just i don't think i, I just don't think i could do it no and i think the um, fact that he had the belief in himself to uh to do it and then executed it i oh, it's just incredible I one of my favorite um medical things is that um as although although um although modern medicine was moving forwards there were several magazine zines out there which would warn people against because you had a lot of fake medicine mixed in with the real and it wasn't just fake medicine as in shamanistic rituals or, or or faith healing or anything like necessary along those lines although i do believe there are i do believe there are documentations where faith healing has worked but that is another conversation for another time like there were lots of fake medicines out there yeah but there were, there were there, placeboic um tablets that were distributed under the guise of yes um, yes, that's and, exactly it. And charms My, and things like that that were sold, that were supposed to the ward off. The placebo tablets are the ones that I'm going after here. The first emperor of China um, took... Uh, I think it was either zinc or lead tablets um, in order to try and gain immortality. That went well and for And die... It. Yeah, well, it he died... Of lead poisoning, um, or was it, it was either lead or zinc poisoning. The thing that really surprised me is that, as late as the eighteen hundreds, there were tablets for. Yeah, there were tablets which were, these. Oh, I can't even remember the exact name of it. There were these. Ta there were these blue tack tablets which were being sold as. Um, both an aphrodisiac, sorry, aphrodisiac, and as a contraceptive, and as you know, these things were like an all-in-one thing, and these were being sold in England, <laughs> and they were is that lead why, and zinc tablets. Is that why Vi Viagra's blue? Uh, you know what? I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> I had not thought of that, but you know what? That that would be interesting. Um. But it just surprises me that, like, as late as the 1800s, uh, poison was legitimately being sold on a mass-produced scale um, as medicine. Yeah, it and doesn't surprise just... me so much. But no, I, okay. I get, I get the. Uh, I mean, everybody wants their own piece, don't they? Their own bit of the puzzle. Um... That's it. Uh... Oh, well, on that depressing note, um, looking forward to the next. Looking forward to the next podcast, uh, listeners. If you're still listening, well done for getting through that. I uh, hope you've learned a thing or two. Hope you've learned a couple of interesting facts from this and had uh, had some fun listening along. Um, yeah, uh, thanks again to uh, my cousin Emily for a lot of this information. Um, and yeah, have have good weeks, everybody. Uh, speak to you all again soon. Goodbye from me and goodbye from me.